All right, so today, since it's the first day of the new year, we're going to talk about something that I hope will stay with you through the rest of this year, and that is this, the goal of every Christian, the aim of everyone who has been born again and received God's incredible gift of eternal life for this new year should be living a life of influence that outlives you. You need to be living for something that's, out, that's going to outlast you. You need to be living for something that's a lot bigger than you are. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to, it's, we're going to tie it a little bit to the, to the part of the Christmas story that we talked about last week. We talked to the Magi, about the Magi that came from the east to Jerusalem and, you know, those, those guys that were the wise guys of the first century. And, and, and so let's look at Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Uh, these are printed for you in the bulletin. They'll be on the, on the screen overhead, or if you have your Bible, you can just open up and find Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judah, or Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who was born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. That's what we're going to be talking about in just a minute. But first, Mike, would you lead us in prayer? Lord Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings that you've poured out on our church today, Lord, and this last year, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you for being able to have the opportunity to be able to reach you in so many different ways for all those who got saved and baptized, Lord. And we pray if there's anybody here in our congregation that needs to hear the Jesus stories, Lord, that it'll reach them. And Lord, we just give you thanks and grace and all that you do for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> So after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it arose and have come to worship him. During last week's lesson, we learned that from the moment of Jesus' birth, Satan was determined to destroy him. The, des the devil desperately sought an opportunity to stop the unfolding of God's eternal rescue plan for humanity, which centered around this child. Then finally, after two long years of waiting, the devil thought his opportunity had arrived in the person of a band of magi from the east. They were members of an ancient society of magicians and astrologers who served in the court of the king of Babylon. We sometimes call them the wise men. Matthew described the arrival of the Magi at Jerusalem when he wrote those verses that we just read. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. During the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We, we saw his star when it arose, and we've come to worship him. Now, the question that I want to answer from a biblical perspective in this lesson is how did the Magi know that a star would lead them to a toddler who had been born king of the Jews? And the reason I say toddler is because by the time we learned this last week, by the time the wise men arrived, Jesus was two years old. He was no longer in Bethlehem where the stable and the manger was. His parents had taken him through Jerusalem, done what the law required them to do after the birth of a baby boy at the temple, run into Simon and Anna there in the temple, and then went back home to Nazareth where they lived. So when the wise men appeared, Jesus was about two years old, the king tried to send them to Bethlehem, but the star led them to Nazareth, to a house, not to Bethlehem, to a stable. And so the story of the Magi from the east occurred because centuries before they arrived in Jerusalem, seeking the one who had been born king of the Jews, a young man made the decision to live a life of influence that would outlive him. Historical data indicates that this young man was probably in his late teens, maybe early 20s, when this happened. His name was Daniel, and his story is recorded in the Old Testament book of Daniel. You see, because 
Daniel was faithful to God, God promoted him to a position of influence over Babylon's wise men, centuries before representatives of that ancient society of advisors to the king showed up at Jerusalem. This is what Daniel wrote in his autobiography in Daniel chapter 2, verse number 18, some excerpts from that verse. He wrote, the king placed Daniel in a high position and placed him in charge of all its wise men. So the king placed Daniel not only in a high position of influence, but in a position so that he could influence not only the kingdom of Babylon, but the influencers of the kingdom, because these magi were advisors to the king, highly educated, highly intelligent minds of men who were the personal advisors of the king. They served in the court of the king, and Daniel is placed in charge of all of them. If you will, he was made president of the magi. And what an influence he must have had. Daniel's influence on that ancient society of advisors to Babylon's king, those magi, was still being felt centuries later when magi from the east came to Jerusalem. The only way, the only reasonable, practical way that we could come up with from just doing a logical study of the Word of God that Magi from the East would have known about one who was going to be born King of the Jews and that a star would lead them to them, to him, is if Daniel had told them and his influence lived on. So from Daniel's story, we can learn valuable lessons on living a life of influence that outlives you. That's what happened to Daniel. He had been dead and gone for centuries when those wise men showed up in Jerusalem. But it was all because of his influence. His influence outlived him. So I want us to take a brief look at Daniel's story. Because sometimes we get the Sunday school version of Daniel's story. You know what I mean by that? And I'm not declaring war on Sunday. School. But the Sunday school version, you know, we, we, we kind of dumb it down for the kids so that they can get hold of it. And sometimes in Sunday school, we never get past the dumbed down stage. You know, it's kind of basic and simple really, really often. And so, and so we're going to go a little deeper than the Sunday school version. You see, when Daniel was a Jewish teenager, Israel, his homeland, was defeated by the Babylonians. And the king of Babylon ordered a guy that he called the master of his eunuchs, to select some of the brightest and best-looking Israeli boys to be transported to Babylon and enrolled in a re-education program to prepare them to serve in the king's court as his personal advisors. These boys are going to be trained to serve as magi, as advisors to the king. They're going to be re-educated, and they're going to be taught all of the highest levels of education of the Babylonian Empire, which was the uncontested superpower of the world of that day. In his autobiography, Daniel wrote about it. He wrote in the third year, this is Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, some excerpts from those verses. He wrote, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hand. So Jehoiakim and the Israelis were defeated by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel, young men, in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them, a three-year re-education program for these teenage boys, preparing the best and the brightest of them to be inducted into the Magi and serve in the king's court. So at the end of that time, they might serve before the king. They might be inducted into this society of highly educated men called the Magi who served as personal advisors to the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah 
were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And the latter three we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's three friends. Now let's learn some lessons. It is significant. It is significant that Daniel is under the care of the master of the eunuchs. Daniel and his friends, all those Hebrew boys, they are, they are placed under the care of the master of the eunuchs. A eunuch is a male who has had his testicles surgically removed and thus rendered sexually impotent. And that is exactly what happened to Daniel and his three friends upon their arrival in Babylon. Now, if you stop and think about that, that adds a whole level, new level of understanding the experience of Daniel and his three friends. These young men had been selected to serve in the king's palace. They were described as young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace. These good-looking young men would be housed in the palace during their three-year re-education program, and that's where the king's harem was also housed. So the king wasn't taking any chances of these young men invading his harem, so he had them surgically transformed into eunuchs. If anyone ever had a justifiable reason to be bitter, it was Daniel and his three friends. You get that? But you know what you find out as you read through the book of Daniel? You never find any trace of bitterness in Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. One of the reasons that they could live a life of influence that outlived them is they refuse to become bitter. The author of the book of Hebrews warned against allowing yourself to become bitter when he wrote this. It's in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 15. It says, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Did you get that? If you allow yourself to become bitter, if you allow a poisonous root of bitterness to spring up in you, it will trouble you. I say it like this, bitter people are troubled people. Do you get that? How many of you know somebody that's bitter? Or maybe you've been bitter yourself. And during that time in your life when you were bitter, or during the time in the life of somebody you know who is bitter, aren't they troubled people? They have trouble functioning in life. They have trouble maintaining relationships. They have trouble holding down a job. They have all kinds of trouble being the men and women that God designed them to be. They have trouble living a life of influence that will outlive them because bitterness will diminish your ability to do so. Troubled people are drastically hindered in their ability to live this life of influence that will outlive them. So as we begin this new year, and we think about living a life of influence that will outlive us, one of the first things that we need to stop and ask ourselves is, am I bitter? Is there somebody who has wounded me deeply? And for whatever reason, maybe it's that I just didn't know how important it was, or maybe I know that I'm supposed to forgive them, and I have just simply chosen not to forgive them because they hurt me so desperately. And I hear people sometimes say, I will never forgive that person. You ever heard that? Maybe you've said that. <coughs> i got to explain this to you. Bitterness is always the result of failure to forgive. When you don't forgive, that unforgiving spirit will produce a root of bitterness in you and trouble you. The only cure for bitterness is forgiveness. And I've got to give this to you. <coughs> it's not worth it. It's not worth it. You refuse to forgive them, and that will begin to eat you up from the inside out. You will become bitter and troubled and hindered in your ability to be the man or the woman God wants you to be. You will be hindered in your ability to live a life that outlive, uh, of influence that outlives you. And the other person 
may not even know it. And if they do know it, they probably don't even care. So you see, refusing to forgive somebody else is like you drinking poison and expecting them to die. You get that? It's going to kill you. It's not going to have much influence at all or effect at all on them. It's not worth it. That's why we're called to forgive. We need to forgive those people that sin against us. We are called to do that. The scripture says it like this, that we are to forgive one another just as God in Christ has forgiven us. We need to forgive, not for their benefit, but for our benefit. That keeps us from becoming bitter. And then, and then our ability to live a life of influence that will outlive us will not be diminished. At least not for that reason. You think Daniel and his friends could have been bitter? Teenage boys, surgically, castrated. You think they could have been bitter? But they chose not to become bitter. And God used them to influence the world for centuries. So, my encouragement to you, don't become bitter. And if you are bitter, forgive. Because that's the only way out of your bitterness. Let's go on. Even when he was in a foreign land, having been subjected to a horrible surgical procedure, and reduced from nobility to slavery, Daniel chose to be faithful to his God. So the next lesson we learn from the life of Daniel is, in addition to don't become bitter, the next one is be faithful. Just be faithful to God. Just be loyal to God regardless of what the circumstances are. You see, in his autobiography, Daniel chapter 1, verse number 8, this is what he wrote. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So Daniel has been taken away to a foreign land, the culture's different, everything's strange to him. He's a teenage boy, but he knows what he's supposed to do according to the word of his God. And so when they offer him a diet of lavishly expensive food, delicacies from the king's table, wine from the king's wine cellar, they offer that to him as his diet. Daniel immediately knows he can't eat that stuff because it would have violated the law of his God because God had some dietary restrictions in place for the nation of Israel. And you say, well, what's the deal with God not letting them eat stuff? God only permitted to them to eat stuff that God knew was good for them. The stuff that was restricted from their diet was stuff that is physically unhealthy for them. And God, as an expression of his love, was protecting the people of Israel through the dietary restrictions that he imposed upon them. And Daniel chose to be faithful to his God, not violate the law of his God by eating stuff from the king's menu that he knew God didn't want him to eat. He chose to be faithful. And I want you to understand this, being faithful to God, being loyal to God, being obedient to God, however you want to describe it, is the result of a an intentional decision. It doesn't just happen. It's the result of an intentional decision. Notice what that verse said. It said, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. What does that mean? As soon as, as, soon as he saw what was coming, he made an intentional decision to do what God wanted him to do rather than what the people in his life at that point that had charge of him wanted him to do. He was going to obey God rather than man. Do you see that? He made the intentional decision to be faithful. And I want to call on you today as men and women of God on this first day of the new year to make the intentional decision to be faithful to God. It will not just happen. It will be the result of a decision that you make in your heart and then rely on the grace of God to help you fulfill that decision. And you say, I just don't know if I can do that. You're right. You can't do it, but God can do it through you by his grace because he said, my grace is sufficient for you. And so we got to learn that lesson. We need to understand that. So 
when we are faithful, God increases our ministry opportunities. When we engage in more ministry, then our influence increases. And as our influence increases, its long-range impact increases. Jesus explained it like this in one of his parables, in one of those stories that he told. He said this to a faithful servant. There's two guys in, in this story that were called faithful. He said to them, well done, good and faithful servant. And this is what he said to them. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. That's in Matthew 25, 21. You were faithful over a few things, so what will I do? Increase your opportunity. I'll make you ruler over many things. So when you're faithful over the opportunities God provides you today, he'll give you more opportunities later. And when you're faithful over that, he'll give you more opportunities later. And when you're faithful over that, more opportunities later. And the more opportunities you have to minister for God, to be an influence for God, the greater your influence becomes. And when your influence becomes greater, then the long-range impact of your influence becomes greater. So you see, you need to make a choice <coughs> to be faithful. This is the way I look at this as a Christian, not just as a pastor, but as a Christian. One of the things that God tells me to do as a Christian <coughs> is to share the good news, right? Preach this good news to the whole creation, make disciples of all the nations. I mean, that's what God wants us to do, right? impacting the lives of people by introducing them to the Jesus story so they can believe it and receive the incredible gift of eternal life and then just disciple them, just teach them more and more about what Jesus has to say so that they can go out and, and do the same thing for somebody else. They can do evangelism. They can do discipleship. And so the cycle just goes on and on and on. That's what God wants us to do. Now, I have lived long enough because I'm 64 years old. Next year, I'll be, or this year, I'll be 65 but I've lived long enough to see the fruit of just trying to be faithful. Here's the thing. This is why I look forward to going to heaven someday. Okay? This is why. Because when I get there, I'm convinced that there are going to be numerous people at the gate that I love waiting to welcome me there. Men and women that I had the opportunity to tell the Jesus story to when I was younger. They were older than me. They believed the story. They got baptized. They served the Lord. And they have since left and gone to heaven. When I get to heaven, I think there's going to be a group of people there waiting to greet me at the gate. Because God used me to tell them the story. And they're there because of that. Do you see that? Do you see how that can charge your life up? And then, and then I look forward to going to heaven because, because there's all these people that are younger than me that I've had the opportunity to tell the story to as I have aged. And, and I know that one day when I get to heaven, there's going to be streams of them coming in and coming in and coming in. Many of them I don't even know. We spent those four years as missionaries, Miss Ginny and I did, in the Philippines and and in, in those four years, more than 6,000 people were saved, and people are still getting saved over there today because of the impact that we had on the lives of a handful of Filipino young people, and churches are all over the country over there that are, that are growing, and, and people are being saved and baptized and discipled, and, and I know that when I get to heaven someday, and I'm standing at the gate waiting for more people to come in, I am convinced that there are going to be people that are going to come in, and they're going to have grateful hearts because God was able to use us and they're going to be people that we don't even know that are going to say I'm here because of what you did while you were living on planet earth that is the kind of influence that we need to be looking for we need to be living a life of influence that will outlive us do you get that and this is the year that we need to start doing that if we haven't already so you got to be faithful and then there's one more thing that I think we can learn from the life of Daniel and that is the importance of remaining under authority. Just do what your authorities ask you to do unless what they're asking you to do violates a higher, the wishes of a higher authority. So if, they're asking, if your human authority is asking you to do something that violates a higher authority, then that's the only time that 
sanctions us not being under authority. We appeal to the higher authority. So because Daniel remained under authority, under the authority of those human authorities that God had placed over him, then God gave him increasing levels of influence. Here's how I know that. Um, in, in his autobiography, again, Daniel, Daniel wrote about this. And, and as you look at this, you can see in Daniel chapter 1, verses 11 to 16, you can see that he remained respectfully under the authority of those God placed over him. Even when he disagreed with them, he was still under their authority. And you know, we tend to think that it's okay for me to be under authority unless I don't agree with you. And then I can rebel. God never sanctions rebellion unless your human authority is asking you to do something God clearly says it's not his will for you to do. Let me give you this. Daniel said to the steward that was a trusted servant, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he said, please test your servants for 10 days. You know, Daniel's thinking about this diet that they're going to expect him to eat. And he's going to come up with a creative alternative. He's going to make a suggestion as an alternative diet so he wouldn't have to violate his conscience and violate the law of his God because he wants to be faithful to his God. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Is he making a demand here? No, he's making a request. When you're under authority, you don't tell your authority what you're going to do. You ask your authority if you could have permission to do this. And that's why he says this. Please test your servants for 10 days. Let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. Let's just try this out. Just let us see. If we are faithful to our God and we just eat what our God tells us to eat, let's see what happens. Does it sound like a man under authority here? And then look. As you see fit, so deal with your servants. What's he saying? Try the test. If our God fails us, if it doesn't work, then we'll do what you ask. Isn't that what he's saying? Is that being under authority? Now, is he worried about his God failing the test? No, he's not worried about that. That's why he could put that out there. And so he says, as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So Daniel is submitting to the authority of the steward who has been placed in charge of his care. So he, that's the steward, consented with them in this matter. Now, who do you think was responsible for con con convincing this steward, this servant, to go along with the test that these boys have proposed? Who do you think was the one who put it on his heart to say, okay, we can try this for 10 days? Had to be God. Had to be God doing that. So, so he, he consented in this matter, and he tested them 10 days, and at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. You know what that tells me? Get under authority and stay there. Look for a creative alternative to be able to do what God wants you to do, and at the same time, not offend your authority, not be guilty of rebellion. Get under authority and stay there, and God will bless you. God blesses those who are under authority. He blessed these four boys. They were healthier than the guys who were eaten from the king's delicacies, and God had his hand in that. Thus the steward took away their portion of the delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. What did God do? God made a way for them to do exactly what God wanted them to do because they weren't bitter because they were being faithful to God and because they were depending on God to work through the human authorities that had been placed over them. And when those three things all lined up, then God increased the opportunities and the influence of Daniel and his three friends. Notice how Daniel's influence increased. This is what he wrote. 
He wrote this in Daniel 1, chapter, uh, or verse 18 through 20. He wrote, at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, and that's at the end of this three-year re-education program, they're going to be brought in and interviewed by the king. Then the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. What has God done? God has blessed them. They are being faithful. They refuse to be bitter. They're staying under authority, and God blesses them so that they have achieved a level of physical, intellectual, and emotional prowess more than any of the other young men who had been brought as slaves from Israel into Babylon. In all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten, <coughs> ten times better <coughs> than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all of his realm. Four teenage boys, brighter, healthier, and wiser than all of the most highly educated men of Babylon, than all of the <coughs> magicians and astrologers. Now let's talk about long-term influence. <coughs> Daniel's influence in Babylon continued to the point that he was not only inducted into that society called the Magi, <coughs> but he was also promoted, inaugurated as the president of the Magi in the aftermath of his interpreting a dream for the king that none of the other magi could interpret, because remember, Daniel has more wisdom and more understanding than all of them. And so <coughs> he's able to interpret this dream in Daniel chapter 2, verse, or chapter 4, um, verse 8. He wrote this The king placed Daniel in a high position and placed him in charge of all the wise men, all the magi. During <clears throat> most of his lifetime, Daniel remained in a position of influence. He wrote, Daniel remained there. He, he remained there among the magi as their president until the first year of King Cyrus. That's a time span of several decades. Most of Daniel's life He's in a position of influence and he keeps on getting more and more influence because he wasn't bitter, he was faithful, and he stayed under authority. Centuries later, Daniel's influence lived on after his death. Centuries later, his influence lived on when Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. The only reasonable explanation for the Magi to know about one who has been born king of the Jews and that they could follow his star to find him was the centuries-old influence of the Hebrew slave boy named Daniel who served among them and influenced them for most of his lifetime. Daniel obviously lived a life of influence that outlived him. We need to do the same. So here's the conclusion. Daniel's influence outlived him because he pointed others to Jesus, the Messiah. And that's why the Magi asked, where is the one who has been born king? That's what the word Messiah means, Christ. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Why did they know that? Daniel's influence outlived him. As I said before, the only reasonable explanation for the Magi to know about Jesus was that Daniel told them. The best way for us to live a life of influence that outlives us is to refuse to become bitter, to remain faithful, and to remain under authority, and point others to Jesus by telling them the Jesus story. He evidently told them what he knew about this, this Messiah who would be born King of the Jews. 
He evidently told them about a star that would arise and it would be a moving star that would lead them to the one who was born king of the Jews. My friend, we need to be telling other people about this same king, the same Messiah, this one that we know as Jesus. We need to point them to him by telling them his story, the Jesus story. After all, he said this in John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him, that means to believe the Jesus story, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. As Daniel told the story, we need to tell the story. But when we tell the story, we need to be free from bitterness. We need to be faithful to the one who tells us to tell the story. And we need to be under the human authorities that God places over us. And when we do that and we tell the story, we not only have influence, but our influence can outlive us.